The thing about this, obviously, this is based on your material. It's based on a trilogy of books. And I'm curious, how did you guys decide how the, because the movie is different than the books in terms of the plot and there's a whole bunch of things that are different. How did you decide the sort of changes? You know what I mean? I know, I know this is a big question, but uh, could you sort of talk about that? Well, my starting premise always in adapting any work, but including my own, is that a movie is a remix. It's never going to be an exact thing. It's not a cover version. It's, you know, it's a remix. You're changing it to suit the needs of what a film has to have. And so it becomes a long, long conversation. And because the book is about 500 pages long, there's just a lot of incident that couldn't possibly be in a two hour film. I mean, it's 110 minutes, something like that. Um, and so you start from the beginning thinking, well, what's important, what's essential? And what's always essential is the themes of it and the relationships and the actual events are, you find are not quite so important as long as the, the key ones are there. So I personally don't mind the changes. Um, I, I expect them, the book remains, um, but it's a long conversation and seeing what fits and what's right. Along the way, was it ever radically different in terms of how you were gonna do things or you know, talk about that initial genesis of the writing process. Not a, not a ton. I mean, the, the, the main challenge was how the noise was going to be portrayed. And that was the thing that occupied most of the creative conversations because, you know, we felt the story was pretty good. Uh, the cast came on pretty early. So we knew how everyone would look and feel, you know, be embodied and what Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley would need and, you know, what their strengths are. It was the most of the creative conversations were about what does thought look like? And how can it not look a mess? And how can it not look cheap? And how can it absolutely positively seem to reflect what someone's thinking? And that those were the very, those are the longest creative conversations. And I'm glad that they were because like there's a scene in the movie, just a quick one where Daisy Ridley's walking up a hill and Tom Holland is behind her and he's grumpily thinking about her. And all of his thoughts are just sort of being cast off the back of his head that we can see. And to me, that's perfect. And all those conversations led to that. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's really, it wasn't so much about how we'd radically change it. It was like, how are we going to make this work so that people understand it? How much time did you spend uh, casting Manchi? How involved did you want to be in that? <laughs> uh, I got sent some pictures and I had, uh, I, you know, I, as, as, as the author and screenwriter, the thing that I tried to do most is be friendly and sane. And, uh, and I find that when you are that, you get a lot more creative involvement. <laughs> Um, and so I just, I, you know, I said, well, this is how I pictured Manchi. This is, uh, particularly the size of Manchi, um, because he is a particular size. Um, and then Doug Lyman, I got sent a whole bunch of casting photos of Doug Lyman playing with dogs. And, uh, and this Winston was the, Winston was the right Manchi. I'm curious. I know that you're involved with Snowblind and Anya's Ghost. Uh, can you give updates on those projects? I uh, can't give one on, on his ghost, uh, but on Snowblind, I am writing it now and uh, working with Jake Gyllenhaal's production company, who are great, great people, and with a director called Gustav Muller. So it's in the writing stages. Um, and yeah, got a deal at Apple. So, I mean, fingers crossed. It's, 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 it shoots in the snow, so it's one of those tricky ones, but um, we're hoping, 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 hoping for maybe later this year for this coming up winter. Yeah, that's what I'm curious about. You can usually, from what I understand, I'm not obviously in these meetings, but you can usually understand from what I under, from what I've been told, how much a studio wants to make something based on how many, how often they're calling you to get updates or whatever. Do you get the vibe that Snowblind is something that you know they really want to make this year? Um, oh, well, I mean, I, again, timing is all dependent on writing and everybody agreeing getting a schedule, but I um, get very much get the feeling uh, that Apple wants to make it. I mean, Apple is really interested in making movies and not, not just everybody's got to fill up their streaming service, but they are uh, the movies that they're choosing and the movies that they're putting themselves behind feel really interesting to me. And they were very, very keen on this and have remained so. So I, as optimistic as you can be in Hollywood, um, which is iffy yeah, exactly. but uh but you know i have i have nothing but good feelings for it last question for you uh you write a lot of books and i'm curious how are you managing your time what books are you working on right now <laughs> uh i was raised by a military father a lovely man he didn't force it on us or anything but he his example was just protestant scandinavian work ethic and so um i just get a lot done over the course of a day and also I, my books took off when I was in my late thirties. And so I know that success is luck and ephemeral and it's timing. 
So while I have opportunities, I want to take them. So I, I work really hard. Uh, I had a new book out last year called Burn. Um, I'm not sure what book I'm going to write next, uh, but I'm working on Snowblind and I'm adapting Lord of the Flies for Luca Guadagnino. So um, I'm busy. I'm busy. Yeah, I could, I could ask a whole bunch of questions on Lord of the Flies, but I got to go. And I'm just going to say uh, congrats on everything. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you very much indeed.